Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'll be talking about human condition and design for it. So I've been working as a product designer and UX designer for perhaps 11 years. Uh, throughout my career, I've been pretty much doing two types of projects. So one type could be uh, purely named as design for physical objects. Uh, m my part usually would be user experience design or UI. Sometimes I would do actual product design, but uh, so it's kind of that part would cover physical objects that people would interact with, and then that interaction would be embedded with the object. Um, and then the second part um, of the things that I, I do is purely digital experiences, uh, games and websites and interaction applications that people consume regardless of the device. So something very virtual. Um, however, there is one main thing that it kind of penetrates uh, my body of work, and that is what I perceive as this huge bridge that I'm building brick by brick every day, um, where on one end it is human condition, and on another end is digital experience. Um, so my talk today is about bridging those two. Why give this talk? So there are two reasons. First of all, I guess within 11 years, I found a lot of curious and peculiar things that I feel relevant to share. Um, interesting stories or observations that really helped me structure my design practice. Um, but above all, there is something very interesting coming soon, and this is what we usually refer to as a perfect storm condition. Um, and perfect storm condition is where all the elements necessary for a new product category, for example, a service or something that would um, redefine the experience, uh, all those conditions are met in one place and time. So it's, it's really optimal. And we're all talk about those new industries like genome sequencing and wearables and home automation and Internet of Things and AI. Um, and they all kind of feel being on, at, on, on the horizon almost. And sometimes we talk about them separately, but really they are the same thing. They're the way that humans going to live in a very recent future, maybe five years from now, in, in my uh, estimate, is, is where we get in a very good perfect storm condition. Now we're kind of starting seeing signs of it forming. Um, and during that time, design and human-centered design will really decide what services and products get into that personal bubbles of every person on Earth and change their life and what products will disappear or die and you know, will be only adopted by um, geeks and people who are really excited about the category itself. So it is really important to start focusing on humans in our design practice and having design practice in whole product development cycle because a lot of products are born purely from idea or let's say possibility of execution. Many times you would realize that you can finally compile something and do something and it's much better than something you experienced before. You don't have a designer in your team, you just have very interesting mechanic for example in games or have a very interesting function or algorithm in digital products and that is kind of the spark that starts the initial product. However, the earlier you put this filter of human-centered design in, the earlier you'll be able to assess um, future possibilities, opportunities, and wall kind of um, brick walls on the way. Um, so what this talk is going to be, it's, it's, it is a very, um, let's say, high-level surface talk that gives you introduction of the key aspects of human condition that I find really important in product development. So this is not a talk about what kind of buttons are better for wearable devices or you know, what kind of color police should be used or you know, uh, no UI, UI practices. It's more of should there even be a smartwatch in 2015 you know, and, and why we have one. Why is it called smartwatch? So, um, and the outcome, hopefully, is generating a, a tool set for each of us. And uh, there are five key aspects and five key tools um, that we can later use every time we engage in either 
improving our product, improving its UX, analyzing it, or creating new product or brainstorming it. So human condition. Well, hopefully we're all human here. I mean, probably maybe some AIs or alien life force, but you know, I think majority are humans. So uh, human condition has a lot of elements to it, like having blood in your body or battling gravity every day when you wake up. Um, we're not going to be touching on those, um, unfortunately. I know they're interesting. Uh, um, what I kind of chose to talk about in design perspective are five components. So if I open human condition, in my mind, um, something very interesting to talk about are, are those five key elements that all really relate and important in product development. Um, so let's start one by one, and each of them will give us a small tool for our tool set. Subjective versus objective. So this is really about reality we live in. You know, uh, there is a word being delusional, and uh, the truth is really that pretty much everyone is delusional, and that's absolutely okay um, if you look at the nature of reality. So um, the way reality really works in human mind is that very good metaphor to think about it is this. You have an interface, uh, the informational field, like a data flowing constantly, and you can think of it as an internet. Um, it is not reality, and it's not objective reality. So there is no such thing as objective reality at all. It, it's impossible. Uh, only subjective reality exists. Um, so that thing, internet, comes to your computer. You, you know that internet does not exist inside your computer, but it gets rendered there. So you get a page. Right? And that page for you is an epitome of internet at that moment of time. So that computer is your mind and brain. So brain is more kind of a hardware. And your mind and, and consciousness is the rendered page being observed. Right? Um, each of us has a different computer. And there are different aspects to it. Some have installed software. And uh, there is also the channel between really the internet data flow and computer. Like you can get a firewall. All those metaphors can be applied to the way we perceive reality. So reality is really right here. Um, that means that every single aspect of products, being it comfort or quality or problem solving, also relies purely within this bubble. You cannot really look at hundreds of bubbles and say, OK, this one actually sells, solves it for everyone. Uh, it just means that every one within that bubble allows them to have that product rendered on their screen. Right? But we really have to think one by one. When design usually starts, or any design assessment starts, we kind of used to it thinking of design as a problem-solving process. We think, OK, there is a problem. It causes pain, and you know, that causes, that creates need and we're solving that need. This is um, very familiar, I hope, design practice. Um, a less familiar and even, even worse design practice is when problem is unknown, um, but we really want to create a need because we realized we can make something. Then the other components are being artificially brought into the picture. Um, but if we look back and think of that computer that renders a page, really the problem is a such a vague abstract unless you work in a niche environment or you have no competition, so your problem is purely utilitarian. Uh, all other times, you need to look in that bubble of reality. In that case, I suggest removing the problem and focusing on pain. It is how problematic or how painful something is perceived by um, our individual, how much need they'll feel. So we really need to think of it as solving someone's not problems, but pain points. Do they feel that they really need something? It is not that they really do. It is not a problem that exists objectively. Uh, but it is something that is perceived painful. And this is our first tool set, is our re realizing the opportunities we may have in product development is looking at the pain. 
and looking at the pain means also looking at happiness. In subjective reality, nothing is purely one. So there's always this kind of duality of yes and no. And pain exists when happiness is not received, which is a bit different from problem. This is why I suggest looking at this from human perspective. For example, if something gives you happiness and you re realize that it gives you happiness, next time when you don't get that happiness, you're in state of pain or anxiety. Um, and if you want to see how digital products solve that, I have two examples. I have Elo, social network, and Instagram. Both those products are tailored, not at problem solving, but pain and addressing happiness. So Elo, um, how many of you are familiar with Elo? This, all right, that's, okay, that's, that's a good percentage. Um, so oh, Elo is, is a kind of avant-garde social network. They don't have ads, and uh, they're trying to be like a new kid on the block, um, being cool because they don't have ads, and uh, you know, they're very welcoming for gay community uh, before Facebook really fixed their agenda. Um, but Elo is also very targeted at creative people. And if you look at how UX is structured at Elo, there are two things that are very easy to do. is to follow a person, but at the same time, don't let them populate your important feed with their noise. And they actually call it noise. Now, for a person who is being followed on the other end, it looks like someone friended them or following. And they don't know either in friend zone or, or they're in, in noise zone. So this creates a gratification loop and happiness for creatives because creatives have a, a subconscious pain of um, craving attention and craving social importance. Uh, so this is really not a problem being solved here, but a purely emotional task. Um, and Elo is doing this very well. If you join Elo and you, you're doing something creative, you'll get much more followers much faster than on any other platforms, like Twitter or even Google Plus, or you know, platforms that are not very uh, overused, you know, still have opportunities to grow. Um, Elo just interface and user journey-wise, the uh, experience-wise tailored to deliver those happiness moments. Um, Instagram is the same, right? Instagram does not solve a problem. It's not really about photo sharing or you know, being in the loop. It's really about happiness you get when you know your friends like something or uh, people you don't know like something, and it's very easy to get. If you, if you just tag your photo, for example, you get 50, 50 tags if, even if you don't have followers. So this is very well tailored because they understand where pain lies, right? Um, in addition to pain, there is a perception of value. So every product in consumer's mind has different components. So one of them gives them pleasure, hopefully, or addresses their pain. And uh, uh, on top of that, there is a value in that product. Value functions like a mesh, like a filter uh, between internet and, and uh, the rendered page. And that filter is inside your computer. Something that is called usually imprinted reality filter, or imprinted filter. Um, we form those th since childhood. Sometimes um, we let other people or authorities or uh, schools of thought to interact with our computer and they plan those filter nets. So you know, religion can be one, your parents can be another, your life priorities that you believe are strong for you can be third one. So information that does not match those that doesn't get rendered. It's like having an ad block. Right? So for, for you, the reality just have, this, this, everyone has those. Um, they also have a s smaller le level of filters and those relate to products. You know, for example, a, a filter of value or meaningfulness is something that is subconsciously attached to projects or uh, to products or services when they deliver w one of the few kind of uh, valuable experiences for people. So one of them is emotional attachment. Uh, in his book, Emotional Design, uh, which I really recommend reading, uh, Don Norman uh, picks this object to talk about emotional attachment. Um, does anyone know what it is? All right, someone says juicer. Yeah, this is really juicer by Philip Stark. Um, 
it is sold by uh, as a juicer um, as well, and you can even try juicing with it. It's really bad as juicer though. Um, <laughs> And they have a gold, golden version of this where they say, don't juice. Just, it's purely sculptural, so, you know, because gold gets uh, oxidized by lemon and you, know, you, you lose the color. Um, so it it's kind of has a function. So if you look from, but, but if you look at this object from like Bauhaus perspective, from the purely functional, and think like, we need to produce a juicer that, that is efficient, uh, this project should not, even, product, it should not even be on the market. Uh, however, it's, it's really iconic and popular because it has something else. It has a value of, for example, conversation, uh, provoking conversations for those who own it, because people usually ask about it. This object is usually also given as a gift rather than purchased for personal use, which attaches that uh, emotional component to it. So when we look at the, at the archetype of a, or, or a, a product category, we may think that really juicer or household item for kitchen has to be utilitarian and very comfortable and that would be problem solving but if we're solving pain points we can think of those aspects that add extra value to it another example and you know i love to talk about wearables and i love doing wearables is this watch there is no secret in it it doesn't show time it it doesn't show anything. There, is no sec there, there are no hidden sensors as well. It's not a fitness tracker or anything else. Uh, it, it's just a piece of metal with the glass and a, a very, uh, very expensive uh, leather band. Um, people still buy it. <coughs> Sometimes people buy watches with uh, analog hands that do show time and have some functions, maybe like uh, uh, an alarm or you know, calendar. Um, but they don't buy them for that function. It is, we, we're just used to watch being that function, but uh, a lot of added value is what subconsciously people use to care about watches. It's either a gift from the long, uh, loved ones, it's either a status symbol, you know, a very expensive watch, and uh, it's either a, a apparel component, maybe not a very important watch, but something that fits your color today. So you have 15 of them, or you, know, you change them all the time. Yeah. Something just funky that you can buy and then throw away, because you were on a trip, a memory. And that is enough for us to wear it every day for those who wear watches. Now look at the tech sector and problem solving approach where every company struggles to identify how to make a habit forming with a computer built in the same form. Now, of course, it's ne never go gonna work because it's still a computer. And once you realize it's a computer, another uh, emotional values that you usually subconsciously attach to the computer also comes into the picture. For example, we know that computer gets old and obsolete in two years. We don't know that about watches. So when you see a miniature computer, you think, oh, this is something that, like, it's an investment, and then, you know, in, in a year or two, should I buy a new one? A and then you also have to charge them. That's something that you also never do with watches. So really, um, calling something as a smart watch um, is, is a bit of play of words. So here, I think we observing a uh, problem solving approach rather than understanding the pain or creating something new for the customer. And when we want to create something new and we talk about value, we should talk about Quelia. Quelia is the concept in philosophy and neuroscience that summarizes the epitome of new experience. Every time you experience something completely new in your life, like first kiss, or observing a Grand Canyon in reality, and you're conscious in that moment, like you're not high or drunk or, you know, just happened and you didn't notice, and you actually think, oh my God, this is vast and beautiful and profound, you create quelia. Those things also physically manifest themselves in your brain as like neurons connect and, you know, it, it turns into being part of your brain. But what important is, human brain physically really love creating quellas. It's something we crave for naturally. That's why we travel. That's why we try experiencing new things. It is hardwired in human nature. It's part of the human condition. New products that feel like magic have opportunity to create quellas. That's why 10 years from now, ago, not from now, uh, we really love changing our phones. I don't know, I change my phone every uh, maybe 
two months or one month. Now, now it's less than a year. Uh, it was absolutely normal to just switch brands or just, uh, just try a new one. That one has 64 colors, and this one has 128 colors. Uh, this one has melodies, and this one has MP3 ringtones. It's amazing. It, it was magical because every time it delivered Quelia. And you, you see where, where it ends, right? Now they're all the same. Uh, Quellias are really hard to do, do, deliver. Maybe you can bend your screen a little bit. and It's kind of a Quellia, but maybe not. So when we're trying to think of a new product, it doesn't have to be physical, even though physical is, is very strong stimuli, because it's, it's tactile and it's also visceral and visual at the same time. But even if you do just digital experience, trying to create Quellia is very important. Trying to think, what kind of new happiness can I deliver to the person? Quellias are very strong in video games. That is why we have right now a very big problem with sexual object objectification, for example, or uh, gratification loops being used over and over in games and not much progress done. The reason for this is we all played video games. And when games were constructed by hardware, there was very little to stimulate the player other than just go straight to those quellias and you know, very, very low-hanging fruits. That created assumption in our brain that we even consciously cannot understand that this is fine, because you know, games of childhood were definitely fine. I played Duke Nukem, it was great. Now you look at it and you think, oh, this is a very sexist game. It should actually should not be made. Um, but if you're a developer and make games, it's really hard to feel it because the quail is inside you. you. You don't really kind of work with it on a conscious level. <coughs> so this is a double kind of uh, edged sword. And the tool we can distill from this is a journey map. You create a journey map that has a day of your user. And on each stage of that day, you ask a question, why? why? Not what and how they're going to use your product, but why would they do that? Why would they put it in the morning? Why would they use it during the day? Why would they charge it in the evening and put it on the next day if it's a wearable? And those questions should be answered through pain or happiness, not through problem solving, because that's not how humans operate. Moving forward, perception of quality. That's another kind of a side to value. Quality is an extra layer as well. There was a study done between Comparing two ATM machines, one had a very nice keyboard, metal keys, beautiful UI on the screen. Another one was purely generic. Fonts, shapes, everything, just very generic. When respondents were asked how they felt about the machines, they said that one of the two performed much better. No one mentioned design, because they didn't ask designers, they, they asked normal people. But they said that one of those two really performed well, felt safer, and was faster to use. Now, the truth is both were the same inside. Like, you know, tap water and Voss water for $100. And, you know, if you package tap water in a, in a Voss bottle, pe people start to feel the price for inside. They, they create those uh, extra assumptions. Design and visceral cl clues can help create perception of quality. And because there is no objective reality, it actually happens. Meaning that same way placebo effect happens, or same way people can taste the mountain top water from the tap if they're told it, it costed $100, <coughs> is not a delusion. Their brain renders it into reality. And because there's no objective reality, it is reality. I have another example for this. Who are you familiar with this? Does anyone? do Android development? All right. What does Apple tell you when the app, uh, app crashes? Do you remember how message is phrased? Right, nothing. Apple doesn't have this message. It, does it mean the apps don't crash on Apple? Well, yes and no. Apple ignores that fact, and in consumers' perception, negative nothing never happened. And because it's purely subjective, it really didn't happen. That's why Apple is much better than Android. <laughs> <laughs> there is another example. Game developers in 1980s knew that there is a big feedback lag in controller 
and reaction on inside the game. So games like Sonic and Mario has actually control lag built in because it was hardware limitation that was not impossible to overcome. However, there are lots of obstacles and, and levels in games where you have to jump over spikes, for example, and people would die a lot. But because the app never told them that it was hardware's problem, the way human mind works is the first subconscious thing to do is to blame yourself. That's why we really hated it, those games and kept playing them. Imagine the app would tell you, ooh, controller was too slow, I'm very sorry. And there's like an OK button or something, right? Very different perception of the product. So the tool we get from here is a design language, an indirect value or quality communication. I say learn from luxury, but forget about money. Money is not just sub you know, um, subjective, it's purely virtual construct. Money or price tag can help ground the user within the zone of quality perception you want them to think the product is. Meaning that if you price something more higher, they may subconsciously attach non-existent values or qualities to that product and feel them, and then their brain will make it happen. Good example is Uber. Uber started as a limo service, not by mistake or constraints. It is a very well thought of UX. Right? This is a user experience from the ground up. You start as a limo service, Uber is, a, is a, uh, you know, almost luxurious or um, premium service. And then you let others interact with the same product at a lower price tier. Sure, cars are different, but you're still using Uber. And at that time, Uber in your reality, and especially at least if, if you once ordered a limo, it even has a qualia for you, um, has this quality perception. Is it more expensive than taxis? No, it's not. Like if you, if you do Uber X, it's actually cheaper than taxis. Is it a very quality product? No, not really, right? But, but it's a luxurious product that managed not only to wrap itself into luxury, but also deliver those sensations either directly or through branding and, and pricing technique at the beginning. Um, now there are two more components. Mind states. Mind states is like a, a condition under which you experience all the previous condition of human uh, nature. So you know, you have subjective reality, you have a perception of value and perception of quality, but there is something else that affects it. And this is kind of a mood, for example, or the state of the mind of the consumer. Uh, I want to focus on, on one particular one. However, uh, I need to mention that, you know, your user shouldn't be frustrated, they shouldn't feel fatigue. You know, you shouldn't really overcomplicate them with choice and things like that. But something very often overlooked is the state of flow. The state of flow it needs, needs few words to be defined. So um, really, state of flow happens when the challenge uh, provided by the product, the challenges are provided by the product are possible to overcome. So it's not too hard. And it's a volunteer experience. So, you, know, you, you don't force your user to face challenges, but he kind of agreed to it. And Tasks are naturally rewarding. That means that you're using natural reward like you let your user learn something or acquire something meaningful rather than giving them a badge or a star. And there is a clear sense of progress. This could be applied to anything from sign-up flows to digital products in general to whole experiences. But of course, we all recognize that something fits this really well and this is video games. This is why the tool is gamification. That doesn't mean that you have to create a game to have your user in the, in the state of flow. You should understand if your product needs the state of flow from the user. A good example that is very far from games is a work environment. Let's say you run a company. You either do a product for productivity, like a productivity app, or you're directly engaged in management position. Your task to increase productivity of the employees in the company. Do you want them to be in flow? Do you want them to really have sense of progress?
focus, engagement. Feel that they can overcome challenges, but challenges are not too easy. Sure you do. And that means that you should gamify the experience to a certain extent. Or include one of few components that are necessary for the flow, like sense of progress. Of course, it's really great in video games as well. So if you're doing a game, be it physical or digital, maintaining the state of flow is absolutely crucial. It drives retention in a natural way. And the final one, longevity. You'd be surprised, right? What is longevity? That's why I have Aubrey de Grey here. So Aubrey de Grey is a head of Sense Foundation, and Sense Foundation, together with, let's say, Calico from Google, are trying to solve aging, right? The expectation is in 30 years from now, and that's exactly where human condition becomes unnecessary, so this talk is also obsolete. Um, we can live either indefinite or at least extra 100 years. Until then, the very important thing is to apply the principles of human condition and not end up with methamphetamine. <laughs> this is what you have to remember all the time. 15 minutes with your product in the morning and in the evening will give 15 hours in a month. If you let your user sleep, that means it's a full day of human life. Full day of human life maybe you took because you let them watch cat photos or you know, tap on the computer screen to earn stars in a virtual game without any more meaningful rewards. Like the user didn't really learn anything, he didn't communicate with real people, he didn't exercise, uh, he didn't conquer his depression or anything. He just burned his time. It's a full day, a month. You can think of it as a human resource or as money if you're really you know, financially centered. You can think of it of a lost salary of that person of one day, money that you could have invested into something, um, but the product could have potentially taken away. So the last tool is empathy. And the credo is don't be a dick, be human. Not a human, but human. You can find me at takimurori at gmail.com or at Twitter. I, I, we might have a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, we can take maybe like one or two. One or two questions if anyone has questions. Thank you very much otherwise. Sure. So uh, gamification is applied everywhere across all kinds of products because it creates the ease of habit forming, for example, and a lot of other metrics that we want if we don't think of humans but think of you know, our users as numbers. Right? If, if we think that we're just mining money or, or time, we really want to gamify it. Um, that is why it is applied. Same way as like, instant gratification is applied everywhere. Um, I think the real balance lies is where you need gamification. For example, uh, area of proximate development. I think it's called area of proximal development. Uh, is a notion in education um, that tells you about a level of challenge any task should have for a child or any person who is undergoing the course to be engaging enough but also beneficial in terms of absorbing information and new material. This is where gamification is perfect because that really correlates with the flow state. If you're, if you're making a, uh, an app where it's meaningful, I think it, it can be totally gamified. When you make an app where it's not meaningful for the user, but you're actually tickling on the um, exploits in their brain and, and kind of exploring the back doors to get them used to it, uh, use it or do something in the app, then it's unethical. And w once you honestly feel it's unethical, uh, you shouldn't do it. That's, that's where empathy comes in mind. You should always think, okay, let, let me multiply it five times. Let's see 
I took five minutes a day, maybe it sounds okay, but what if it's 25 minutes, and what if it's my kid? And then if you don't feel good about it, well, don't do it. If you, have, if you have opportunity not to do it, don't do it. If you don't have opportunity, but you're within a bigger company, quit that company. Be human. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.